there was this story of a church choir director who was very frustrated with the sporadic or inconsistent attendance of all the choir members as they were rehearsing for their choral concert. And so at the final rehearsal, he announced, I want to personally thank the pianist for being the only person in this entire church choir to attend each and every rehearsal during this past two months. And so all the choir members were appreciating her. They were cheering her on. And so the pianist actually stood up and bowed and expressed herself and said, well, it was the least that I could do, considering actually that I'm not sure if I'll be able to be at the choral concert tonight. I'm sure that you would all agree that the culprit of this scenario is because the person responsible for the task or the duty, or in this case, the pianist, has some commitment issues, right? Perhaps at some point, you also have been in the shoes of that director or conductor that we know how terrible it feels when someone makes a commitment, but they don't fully uh, thought through. They haven't fully thought through how they plan to go about it, or they didn't even make their best effort to meet or follow through the commitment they had made. I believe there is something that we can, e- this is something that we can easily recognize and understand because we have somehow similar experiences of it. However, have we also realized that more often than not, we on the other hand have actually done the same thing, that we also many times are also like the members of the choir, or the pianist when it comes to our commitment in our spiritual matters. As followers of Christ, we also make commitments. Therefore, God also has expectations from us. But if we would honestly ask ourselves, how well are we truly able to fulfill and follow through to meet the spiritual commitments that we have made before God? I'm sure all of us would want to say that we are able to do so 100% of the time. But truth be told, the tough reality is, for many, if not most of us, we struggle in keeping up with our spiritual commitments. But why is that so? And so for our time together, we would like to identify three common factors that often hinders us from fully following Christ. And our prayer is that as we become more aware of them, we would be able to better guard ourselves from these tendencies and thereby improving our pursuit to follow and be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. The narrative that we'll be looking into is found in Luke chapter 9, verses 57 to 62. But before we move ahead, let me give a bit of a context or background. So Jesus was with his disciples. They were going to Jerusalem, and they passed by a Samaritan village. Somehow they were expecting that uh, people would be receptive, they would be responsive. Unfortunately, those who were supposed to receive Jesus' invitation rejected him big time. And so they proceeded, and they moved on to another village. And surprisingly this time, an unexpected turn of events took place. From people openly rejecting Jesus, now we will actually be seeing three individuals who would be openly expressing how much they wanted to follow him. However, what we will see is that while we would be seeing their desire to follow, which often like many of us do, Jesus now is going to address their heart condition. Jesus is going to challenge them and make them evaluate their hearts so that it will reveal the true degree of their commitment, and compare it to what Jesus actually requires of those who say they want to follow him. In Luke chapter 9, verse 57, it begins, Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Here we meet the first guy, and we see him making a very bold statement. He said to Jesus, I will follow you Wherever you go, finally, someone is up for the call. Finally, someone was up for the challenge. And that should be a good thing, right? And so this is what Jesus had to say. Verse 58, Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, perhaps you're also wondering, why in the world 
did Jesus reply that way? Didn't the guy just said the right thing? Wasn't he supposed to be the one that Jesus is supposed to rejoice in or, or celebrate? Wasn't he already voluntarily saying he was going to follow Jesus? In fact, he said, wherever you go, he's just saying, I'm going to do everything you tell me to do. Well, we don't exactly know a lot about this guy. According to Matthew, he was a scribe. Maybe he was someone who at least had a reputable status. Perhaps he had a pretty settled life and with certain conveniences, certain comforts. And I guess Jesus, being around people long enough, he probably had the idea that this guy was thinking following him is going to be a blast. He must have recognized that this guy's expectations need to be set and see how serious he really is with what he actually said. So Jesus frankly tells him the hard truth. To put it another way, Jesus' words meant that if you want to seriously follow me, I want you to know that it's not going to be a life of ease or comfort. Jesus was saying, don't expect that life will just be the same as you are right now and you just add Jesus in. Rather, Jesus wants him to realize that when you decide to follow me, it will entail changes in your life. There will be things that you would need you will need to adjust. There are things that you will need to cut off. There will be things that you would even need to give up altogether so that you can live up to that commitment of being a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. I wonder, how did this guy actually react after hearing Jesus' words? But here lies the first hindrance that you and I need to be aware of that we need to also guard ourselves from if we truly desire to follow through our spiritual commitments as a firm believer of Jesus Christ. And the first hindrance to our spiritual commitments is what we call discomforts. The first hindrance to our spiritual commitments is what we call discomforts. See, just like this guy, we often do have that sincere desire to go all out for Christ. But along the way, we come to the reality that pursuing a Christ-centered life often comes with struggles and sacrifices. How many times have you also, in the same way, said to God, God, I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. But once we look closely to what He asks of us, once we understand what it entails, we realize, man, it's too much hassle. It's too inconvenient. It's too uncomfortable. I'm not sure if I'm really going to be able to to do it. It's just like Jesus telling us to love our enemies or that we are to reconcile or be forgiving regardless of the hurt or the pain that have been inflicted to us. If you would be asked, would you immediately make the first move to follow simply because Christ said so? Perhaps you came to realize that you need to give up a habit or maybe limit a hobby for the good of another person in the faith. But that is something that you so enjoy a lot. Would you make that sacrifice for the sake of Christ? Maybe you were able to recognize an unhealthy relationship or perhaps an inappropriate one that is not pleasing to the Lord. And so the solution is that you would need to stop it or to break it up. Would you do it no matter how much it hurts? Perhaps you understood that you had a business deal that you have been accommodating for so long, but you realize now that you need to cut ties because there is a breach in integrity and you know that you need to make it right. Would you trust God enough for it, even if you know that that is where you get your provision, that is where you get your finances, that you are uncertain what's going to happen next? Or perhaps a ministry opportunity or a calling that you, have been, that you have been called to do and have been open for you to serve and be a part of. But every time you realize it needs a lot of your time, it needs a lot of your effort, your resources, but come to think of it, is Christ worth your effort and discomfort? You see, times such as these makes us pause. They give us second thoughts, isn't it? Because we tend to pick and choose the ones we like or don't like to follow through. And often our main basis for it is if it is going to be convenient and if it's something that will not disrupt our life's peace. 
That is why we often end up not making a lot of progress or nor even do we pursue much of what we said we will do, even if we said before that we're going to do anything and everything for Christ. I remember of a man who wrote to his girlfriend and said, Susie, I love you so much. I would climb the highest mountain. I would cross the driest desert. I would sail the most tempestuous seas for you. And by the way, see you on Sunday if it doesn't rain. See, I love what Lou Nichols, a missionary, once said. It is so easy to say that we are committed to doing whatever the Lord wants us to do. But oftentimes, we come to the Lord with a long list of our plans and ask the Lord to actually bless those plans. And if what we ask us to do is not in those plans, we disregard them. We don't think it's worth us following. It's uncomfortable. But I love what Lou also shared about George Murray, a missionary to Italy, when he was speaking to a crowd once, he said, what is your idea of, com- of commitment? And then he held out a blank sheet of paper and he said, is it to sign your name at the bottom of this blank sheet and let God fill in it whatever he wills? You see, Jesus' point here is not to make us live a difficult life. Nor does he mean that we need to be poor so that we can show that we are truly committed to following him. But it is about cultivating the right attitude, cultivating the right mindset, one that is willing and ready to endure and persevere for the sake of Christ. Because that is part and parcel of living the Christian life that is genuinely committed to following Jesus fully. I love this quote that someone has said, if you're serious about change, you have to go through uncomfortable situations. Stop trying to dodge the process. It's the only way to grow. You see, it is in facing challenges that reveal what or who is of prime importance to us. And they reflect in the decisions and choices that we make. It is in unpleasant times that shows what or who truly occupies our loyalty, our devotion, and as to what or who we truly pursue. Let's move ahead and meet the second guy that Jesus actually encountered. And this is found in Luke chapter 9, verse 59. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Well, interestingly, this time, Jesus took the first move. He invited this guy to join him. I'm not sure how they met. I'm not sure how they come across along the road. Uh, But interestingly, this guy didn't say no. Perhaps he had already an idea who Jesus was. Instead, he responded, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. It sounds like a very legitimate concern, right? Because he's probably just trying to fulfill his family obligations first. But look at what Jesus had to say in verse 60. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but it must be stunning to hear such a response after you know, hearing an invitation from the same person, isn't it? You might be asking, what's wrong with fulfilling family duties? Wasn't that, you know, again, the right thing to do? See, back then, even up to today, giving a proper death and burial is a big thing. Uh, there, there are possible scenarios in this guy's a situation. Did the father just, you know, recently died? We're not sure, but if that is the case, the, ki- the guy shouldn't be there at that point. He shouldn't be roaming around. He should be there at the funeral. Or perhaps the dad was terminally ill and was just counting the days before he passes away. Another possibility is another Jewish funerary custom in which after someone died, they actually waited for about a year and once the flesh has fully deteriorated and uh, have rotten away, they collect all the bones and put them in a bone box and they uh, again make another another re-internment or reburial. Whichever the case, no? It certainly appears that this guy's concern is a legitimate one. However, what's interesting is that whenever Jesus 
you know, re- encounter such scenarios, he would often respond in such a way that it will reveal the person's real motives. And so when Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead, he wasn't telling him to be disrespectful. He wasn't telling him to just forsake his responsibilities. Rather, Jesus was making him realize that someone else who didn't have the same spiritual responsibility, someone else who didn't have the spiritual commitment as you do, could be able to do that job instead. But you, on the other hand, have that commitment that only you can do for the Lord. See, the truth of the matter is, what this man was trying to do was that he must be trying, just trying to buy himself more time. Somehow, he was using his situation as an excuse and probably was actually wanting Jesus' approval that he can postpone his following and just obey later on. So the point of Jesus' words was to challenge this person by saying that when you want to commit to follow me, you must have a sense of urgency. To follow Jesus must take priority rather than it is something to put aside for more important matters. I again wonder, what did this guy do after hearing the words of Jesus? But here lies a second hindrance that holds us back from following through our commitment as a firm follower of Jesus Christ. The second hindrance to our spiritual commitments is what we call delays. The second hindrance to our spiritual commitments is what we call delays. In other words, another way that I would put it is when we allow ourselves to go through spiritual procrastination. See, many a times, we are aware that as believers, we have spiritual responsibilities. God expects a lot of us that we ought to do, that we ought to live out and meet because that is part of living the new life that we have in Christ. Perhaps it's about building spiritual disciplines. Perhaps it's building spiritual habits that will grow our walk with the Lord. Maybe it's getting baptized so that you can proclaim to the world that you are a follower of Christ, that the world may know that you are a follower of Jesus. Perhaps it's worshiping on a regular basis. Maybe it's finding an opportunity to serve the church because we are all part of the body of Christ or maybe it is to share the gospel. Whatever that may be, see, the problem is we don't see the need to act immediately even in these things. Uh, we tend to think, we tend to justify, convince ourselves that, nah, there's always tomorrow and there's always a next time. We don't see the urgency for us to act on them. And with so many matters demanding our time, if there's anyone that can wait, that's God. See, it's interesting how for many of us, there are many matters or even people that we do not, we wouldn't even dare to let them wait, right? As soon as we receive a chat, as soon as we see that notification, we can't wait but just want, we want to respond right away. Or if it is a, about a certain matter, we choose to attend to them as soon as possible. But why is it that when it comes to, but that when it comes to the Lord, we have a really hard time doing just that? Is he really that less of an important person? Is he really of a less priority compared to someone or something else that may also demand of your time? You know, one thing I've also realized is that oftentimes, spiritual delays may also come in the form of good things, such as ambitions, such as dreams, goals, or even responsibilities that we aspire to accomplish or, for, or fulfill Yet the problem is, is that they are the ones that often take the place of our spiritual pursuits. One of the things I truly miss because of this uh, situation that we are in is attending uh, school retreats, being able to interact with the young people and being able to get to know uh, our young generation growing up. I remember this one retreat wherein I've met this student. In fact, I was able to share one-on-one with him, and uh, he was very known for winning numerous competitions. This guy is someone that's really smart, bagging a lot of awards here and there, and he's well acknowledged. But as I get to talk to this person, what came to me, what I hear a lot from him is that when it comes to spiritual matters, he always tells me, I don't have time for that. 
I don't see the need for it now. He mentions that maybe one day, if he sees the need of it, perhaps he would give the focus then. Perhaps when the need arises, he will give it a try. But for now, he will just enjoy his youth. He will just take advantage of the things that he can enjoy for now. But spiritual matters, God, next time. What a sad truth, isn't it? Even exposed of the Christian truths, of the Christian life, the very blessings of God became the very obstacle so that he would pursue God as well. Imagine what could he have become, what God could have done or accomplished through him if he would actually involve God in his endeavors. See, truth is sometimes we miss out the best because we settle for the good. See, delayed obedience is still disobedience. As the Tagalog saying goes, pag gusto maraming paraan, pag ayaw maraming dahilan. In other words, if you really want to do it, you'll make every effort so you can fulfill something. But if you truly don't want to do something, you'll make all the excuses not to do it. Friends, let's redeem our time and make the most out of it as Jesus calls us to do so that following Him must always be in the now. Not later, not tomorrow, not next week, next month, next year. When Jesus calls us to do something, it is always for the now. Now let's hear about the, the third and last encounter that Jesus had found in verse 61. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. Now here's the third guy who responded similar to the very first guy. He also is one who is all out for Jesus, that he wants to follow Jesus' call, whatever it takes. He simply requested to shortly go home for a bit, say his last few words to bid farewell, and he is all set. He is on board. And now, this is what Jesus' response is in verse 62. But Jesus said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. If you're like me, you've also, you probably also ask, is it too much to ask to say goodbye? Isn't that a normal thing for anyone to do if he's going elsewhere? What's the big deal of saying goodbye? See, Jesus wasn't saying here to just forsake and forget about everybody else and just leave, right? Uh, notice his analogy. He was saying that when someone, just like a farmer, who is actually plowing, you can't keep on going back or keep on looking backwards because uh, that will limit you. You won't be able to move forward. You won't get anywhere or get anything done if that is what you do. In other words, what Jesus is trying to emphasize was that if you're going to commit to follow me, your focus, your attention can't also be occupied by other matters. See, perhaps Jesus knew that if this guy actually went home, probably he won't be back. So Jesus was saying this kind of attitude which easily gets diverted or distracted is one that is not fit to follow me. And here lies the third hindrance that can hold us back from following through our spiritual commitments as a firm follower of Jesus. The, the third hindrance to our spiritual commitments is what we call distractions. The third hindrance to our spiritual commitments is what we call distractions. I remember of a story of a farmer who one morning told his wife that he was going to pluck the ripened fruits from their field. And so he got on, he got off early in the morning to start the day. So he started to warm up the truck and he realized he needed to get some more petrol or gasoline. So he went to the store to get it. And on the way, he noticed that some of their pigs weren't fed. And so he proceeded to the corn crib and he found some of the sacks of feed. And so he took it and he realized as he was about to leave, Beside the sacks were potatoes. There were, they were sprouting as well. And so he started to take off some of the potatoes. And as he was doing that, he noticed there was a pile of wood. And he remembered, oh, my wife wanted some wood at home. 
And so he started to pick up some of the sticks. And as he was doing that, there was an ailing chicken who passed by. And so he realized the chicken need help. And so he dropped off the wood. He went on, picked up the chicken, attended to it. And after all these things that have happened and taken place, the next thing he realized, it was already noontime. And he was so frustrated, he hadn't even accomplished anything, not even the truck, let alone any in the field. But by now, it was already lunchtime. It was really hot. The ripened fruits have already started dropping. Have you also ever intended to do something you knew that was very important only to find yourself in a similar situation, so distracted by so many other seemingly important tasks, which you realize later on kept you from actually accomplishing your main objective? Well, this also happens to us a lot of times, right? There are just so many things around us that demand of our attention and our focus. And truth be told, we also get diverted so easily. And it happens to us most of the time, especially when we are supposed to focus on our spiritual agendas. Like in our generation saturated with social media and digital platforms, us being so accustomed to multitasking, we tend to have this very short attention span and we easily lose focus. It's like when you are doing your devotional times or quiet times, but you do it on your gadgets so whenever you would see that chat, you would see that a social media notification, you can't help but check it out, right? And thereby getting you actually distracted. Or perhaps whenever you would do your prayer times, while you are supposed to be focusing on what you are to communicate to God, that you would want to be sensitive to God, what actually fills our mind is actually the next project, the next place to go to, the next thing that we are to be about to get done. Or maybe whenever we are actually doing our worship times, we multitask and convince ourselves that while worshiping, we can also scroll through what's new. You see, it is very crucial that we are aware and are conscious of the things that can so easily distract us from our spiritual pursuits. Because over time, no matter how little they are, they will make a lot of difference in our spiritual commitments. I remember Craig Rochelle once shared this. He said, when did Daniel learn to trust God? And he said, the answer is, he didn't learn it in the lion's den. He learned in his prayer closet. His faith wasn't built in the battle. His faith is built when he was on his knees. He had consistently sought after the heart of God three times a day, day after day, week after week, month after month. He consistently sought God. And why is it that some of us are inconsistent with our relationship with God, he asked. He said, it's because Daniel prayed consistently while we pray occasionally. And I think this next line is what hits the point. He said, it is not the things we do occasionally that makes the difference. It is what we do consistently. Let me repeat that. It is not the things we do occasionally that makes the difference. It is what we do consistently. And so it is in our spiritual commitments. It is the things that we do consistently that will make the difference. It is when we consistently leave behind the distractions and not, not letting it get in the way of our spiritual commitments to the Lord. In the same way, when we want to pursue our spiritual commitments, it is in the consistency of them that makes the difference in our commitment to God. When we genuinely desire to make a firm commitment to follow Christ, to be more like Him, to be a faithful disciple, we are to bear in mind, we are to take to heart that keeping our spiritual pursuits must be a daily lifestyle. It is an everyday spiritual battle. When we want to focus on Jesus, we must ensure that we will allow nothing to distract us from pursuing Him. That you and I need to be intentional to minimize, even, even eliminate whatever takes away our attention and focus on Christ in order to give Him the undivided attention that we can reach 
our spiritual potential and spiritual goals. Because at the end of the day, our spiritual commitments are made not just to be set, they are made to be met. Let me repeat that. Our spiritual commitments are made not just to be set, they are made to be met. See, it's interesting to note how from these three interactions, how each of them have no record of their responses. I wonder, what could be, have been their response? What could have been their realizations after hearing from Jesus? Could they have actually proceeded or not? I like how Dr. Mark Bailey, former president of Dallas Theological Seminary, have encapsulated this uh, short excerpt. He said, Mr. Too Hasty was too concerned with the comforts of this life. Mr. Too Hesitant was too concerned with the cares of this life. And Mr. Too Homesick was too involved with the companions of this life. And then he said, those three kinds of people can't be used effectively for Jesus Christ. See, the better question I guess that we can ask right now is, how about you? How about us? Which among the three do we best identify? Perhaps the one that we find ourselves most, most struggling with and we realize it necessitates a lot of work for us. Is it embracing too much convenience or comforts? Perhaps we're stalling too much time? Or is it too much task or matters that take away our attention and focus rather than pursuing our spiritual commitments. See, being a disciple of Jesus necessitates that one be aware and intentionally eliminating the hindrances of discomforts, delays, and distractions so that we can ensure that none of these will get in the way of our desire to be faithful and give our full allegiance to Christ and to His pursuits. See, being a disciple of Jesus demands a radical kind of commitment, one that is exemplified through unwavering discipline, fueled by persistency, urgency, and consistency. And being a disciple of Jesus is cultivating a lifestyle that must shape our lifetime, exemplifying that Christ is our all, before all, and above all. My friends, our time and energy are limited. We can only commit and give of ourselves to only so much. And my prayer is that God will occupy the most part of that, that He is important enough that He will never be the one to be put aside nor to be given little or no attention in our life because you see that He is worthy of our sacrifice just as how he saw you and me worthy to die for. I love a quote that someone once said, commitment is what strips away the excuses and makes you get serious about God because God is serious about you and he is committed to you. Imagine if Jesus had let the discomfort of his calling, of his mission get in the way or if he actually procrastinated and delayed continuously until the task at hand was overlooked, what would that be for us? What if he actually allowed the distractions to actually take away his focus and thereby him not being able to accomplish his mission? What would that have become of our life? My friends, brothers and sisters, it's never too late to start again. It's still early, early in the year, and how about if we recommit once again? How about if we would also begin to have a heart that would seek to live a life that returns the favor, one that is fully committed to putting Jesus first and at the center of it all, not out of obligation, but out of a heart of gratitude, because you realize He is worth it. He is worth all of you and all of your faithfulness more than anyone or anything that this world has to offer. Would you join me as we close in a word of prayer? 
Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much because you are a faithful God, one who is true to your commitments to your people. It is our prayer, O oh Father, that as we have learned, Father God, the hindrances that often limits us or hinders us to be fully committed to you. We pray, Lord, that you would be the one to search us, to speak to us. We pray, O oh God, that you would provide insight and wisdom so that as we pursue the year that is ahead of us, we desire that our spiritual commitments this time would thrive. They would one that would be exemplified in our life as a testimony to the world that you are indeed most important in our life, more than anyone, more than anything in this world. Just as how you have shown to us your commitment, your love, your unwavering faithfulness, it is our opportunity and privilege to live a life doing so as well in freedom, in joy, and in love. We thank you so much, Lord, for all that you do, and may we do just that in honor and to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.